Hello everyone, this is Ayushi Gupta. Welcome to the 22nd episode of Microsoft Hour of Code, brought to you by Million Lights. Million Lights is a TV channel dedicated to improving skills of people in their employability. Now let me tell you a little more about the Microsoft Hour of Code. Microsoft Hour of Code is a series of lectures, courses and talks by experts who are going to be discussing the latest Microsoft technology topics related to programming and industry forecasts that are all focused on employability. Today, we are going to learn the C-sharp fundamentals. This is a beginner's course for people pursuing computer science. These episodes have everything you need to upgrade your skills. These courses are not only beneficial for students, but also for working people. As you know, today we are going to learn the C-sharp fundamentals. This content has been created by our partner Microsoft. We have Bob Tabor from Microsoft with us, who will help you learn the fundamentals of C-sharp. But before we start, you need to have a computer system with a 64-bit processor or a 32-bit processor. Other required tools are a Windows notepad and any web browser such as Internet Explorer. If you want to learn a different programming language, c -sharp is a great place to start. Tune in to learn the basics of the c -sharp language and learn to apply them in your programming endeavors like video games, mobile environments and client apps. Let's move towards the course. The topics we are going to cover in this episode are Working with dates and times in which we will find out how to work with date and time data. How to create new instances of date time how to add time and how to format data for display and the time span class. Understanding classes in which we will learn how classes are defined and new instances are created. How to define properties and how to set values and get values for a given instance of class. More about classes and methods. We will dig more into the details about classes, creating a new instance, add class references, pass the reference to a method, review overloaded methods, static versus instances methods and constructors. So let's get started. Hi, I'm Bob Tabor with Developer University. For more of my training videos for beginners, please visit me at devu.com. In the previous lesson, we looked at how to format strings and how to manipulate strings, whether it be for display or for the purpose of massaging data. In this lesson, we'll do the same thing except for dates. So we'll start off by talking about formatting dates and times. We'll look at how to add and subtract time to a given date. We'll look at how to create a date time object uh, in, that represents this moment in time or the past or the future. And then finally, we'll look at how to determine the length or the duration of time between two date time objects. So to begin, I've created a new project called Dates and Times. Pause the video, please, and catch up with me. Uh, and what we'll do here is actually just create a new date time object by going date time, and we'll just call this my value. And we're going to initialize its value to a valid date time. So the easiest way to do that is to represent this very moment as the application is executing. So we'll go date time dot now, and that represents this instant. All right. And the easiest thing that we can do is just do a console dot write line taking my value and calling the toString method. Now you'll see we have a lot of two something strings and we'll look at a several of these uh, in an effort to format our, our date time uh, the way that we want. But this default toString method will take our, our country and our um, locale and will uh, present dates and times as 
They are typically presented in our country and in our culture. So here in the United States, we usually represent the month first and then the date. I know in other countries, most other countries, it's date, month, year. Uh, and then we have the time of afternoon that I'm actually recording the video. Notice that it also has AM, PM as opposed to military time or 24 hours. So in order to change the way that this is presented, we're given a bunch of other additional helper methods. Uh, and so we can do something like this. So my value dot two short date string, and this will this will just display the month date year. We can also do and isolate the short time string. So here we just want to display what time of day it is. All right, 3.35 in the afternoon, great. Uh, we can also choose a more long form version of the date. And you can see it's Tuesday, March 15, 2016 as I record this. And we can do the same longer version for time as well. So my value dot too long time string. All right, and so you can see not only do we have hours and minutes, but also seconds uh, in the long time string. Great. All right, so oftentimes what we'll want to do is do some date time math, which means we either want to add hours, minutes, I guess uh, seconds, uh, seconds, minutes, hours, uh, days, months, years, whatever the case might be. But we can do it through a series of helper methods, uh, the add methods. So here I'm just going to console write line and we'll take uh, my value and we'll start off with something simple like add days. You can see that we can add milliseconds, seconds, uh, hours, days, and everything up from there. So let's just do something simple like add days. So we'll add three days and then we'll just do a two long date string on it like that. Now you may have noticed me do this in the past where uh, I've used the, um, the period, remember that's the member access operator, and chain together a series of commands. So in this case, we have a value that represents a date. If I were to call the add days method, notice as I hover my mouse cursor over it, that the return value of add days is another date time. So now since I have another date time in my hand that represents today plus three days, then I can call that date times too long date time string, which now returns, as you can see, a string data type. So that's the notion of chaining method calls together as long as you continue to chain together methods that return some value of some data type you can continue to call methods for that given data type all right so let's go ahead and see now three days from now it will be in fact march friday the march 18th and let's do uh, something with regards to hours and uh, let's um, Go my value add hours and we'll add three hours to long time string and that will be 6.38 p.m. okay and then what if I wanted to subtract time are there any subtract hours or subtract days no however what you can do is simply um, use a negative number to subtract. So in, instead of adding days, I'll subtract days. And uh, yeah, we'll just go ahead and run that. And you can see three days ago, it was Saturday, March 12th. Great. All right, so in addition, we can just grab off parts of a date or time. So uh, here again, let's go, whoops. Let's go my value and let's just pull off this current month and this will return an integer. Now console.write line we know can accept an integer so we'll just go ahead and print out the current month. So the third month obviously that's going to be March. Okay. 
All right, now we've looked at how to create the current date time, but what if I wanted to create a date time in the past or in the future? I could do something like this. So date time, and I'm gonna call this my birthday. Uh, and here again is that new keyword that we've, I've hinted at a number of times. We will get to it, don't, don't worry, uh, but I'm gonna use it one more time, new date time. And I'm gonna pass in the year, 1969, the month, December, and then the day, the 7th. That was when the day I was born. And so now what I can do is uh, something like we've been doing up to this point, console.writeline, and just uh, my birthday dot two short uh, date string just to prove that it's a date just like the other dates that we've been working with. So 12-7-1969. All right. Now there's one final way to create a new date time. So let's create another version of birthday equals date time dot parse. Remember we've used int parse. We were able to take a string and turn it into an integer. Here we're going to take a string and turn it into a date, hopefully. So we'll just type in my birthday again one more time. And that should give us a date time object that represents December 7, 1969. Uh, and now what I'm going to do is try to determine how many hours that I've been alive or how many days I've been alive. Days is probably a more interesting number. And in order to represent a span of time, we're going to use a new data type called time span. So here I'm going to use a new time span. And we're going to call this my age equals datetime.now dot subtract and the subtract method will take a uh, the current date and subtract whatever date we want to use so in this case we'll use my birthday okay so now that I have an object that represents a span of time I can say uh, represent that span of time in terms of days or years or whatever the case might be so to do that, I'll go console.writeline, and then I'll use this myAge dot. And here I can say, give me the total number of days that I've been alive. And print those to screen. And you can see I've been alive, what, almost, well, 16,900 days. Whew. I'm getting old, okay? I say that every time I record this video, and I feel older every time. So at any rate, uh, here we were able to uh, format dates for display. We were able to manipulate dates by adding and subtracting date and time. And then we were able to determine the, uh, the difference between two dates using a time span object. We also talked about different ways to create a date, whether it be now or sometime in the past or future, by either just using one of the uh, versions of the date time objects constructor, we'll talk about that later, or by using datetime.parse and passing in a string. Okay, so uh, let's stop right there and we'll pick it up in the next lesson. Doing great. See you there. Thanks. Hi, I'm Bob Tabor with Developer University. For more of my training videos for beginners, please visit me at devview.com. You might recall at the outset of this course, I said that a class is a container for related methods. And I used the console class as an example of this. We had the console.write line, console.read line, console.write, we even used console.clear. All of these methods that had something to do with working with a console window. And so I said it makes sense to put them all in the same class, the console class. Now truth be told, I intentionally oversimplified uh, my explanation about classes and their relationship to methods because first of all, I wanted you to gain a little bit of confidence in yourself that you can do this, that this isn't hard. You can get your hands around it and you're gonna do just fine. Uh, and I wanted to do that before we got into the topic of classes because while there's nothing hard per se about classes, they do lend themselves to a conversation about object-oriented programming, a style of programming that some beginners find a little bit difficult to grasp at first. Now, the code that you've been writing in your methods 
have all been defined inside of classes, right? And you've been calling methods that were defined inside of classes, right? Classes have been all around you. You've been working with them up from the first line of code that you wrote. So you're really already an old pro at this, whether you realize it or not. I'm merely going to fill in some of the details that you don't yet know about in this lesson and in a couple of uh, subsequent lessons so that it rounds out your knowledge so that you can fully harness the power of the .NET Framework class library in your applications. Yeah, okay, maybe someday, whenever you sit down to architect some big application for some large company that you go to work for, you'll begin to think like an experienced, object-oriented software developer. But at this early point in your C-sharp experience, I really just want you to be able to do one thing and one thing well. That is to find what you're looking for in the .NET Framework class library and be able to have the confidence to utilize the methods and the properties in those classes that have been defined there. All right. So the truth of the matter is that object-oriented programming is such a massive topic that I certainly couldn't do it justice in this course. In fact, I have a whole course devoted to it on devu.com. Again, I really just want to accomplish one thing here. I want you to know enough about classes and objects and properties and methods and things like that so that you can harness the power of the .NET Framework class library inside of your own applications. Now the way that we're going to learn about classes and methods and properties and all that good stuff is by creating simple custom classes of our very own. So let's start by talking about creating a simple application uh, for a car lot. So suppose that I own a car lot and I want to sell cars. And I want to build an application that helps me keep track of all the cars on my car lot. So I might need to create a number of, of variables to hold information about a given car because I'm going to use that information to then determine its value based on its make and its model and its year and so on, right? So I might start off by creating a couple of, uh, of uh, variables called car one make, car one model, car one year and so on in order to keep track of that information. Now, what if I need a second car in my application? Well, then I guess I could create another set of variables called car two make, car two model, car two year. Uh, what if I need a third one? Well, I think you see where I'm going with this. Things are going to get out of hand pretty quickly here. Then what if I decide one day that the value of the car is not only based on the make, model, and the year, but we also need to keep track of the color of the car as well. So in that case, now i got to do a car one color, uh, car string, car two color, and so on. All right, so you can see that this simply is not the right approach to keep track of information that should be collected together about a given entity. So uh, I need a way to keep all of this data about a car kind of together in its own little container. I want to keep track of the make, the model, the year, the color, and maybe a bunch of other things too about a single car. But I don't want to have to treat it like a bunch of loose information. I need it all kind of related together. So what I'm going to do is start off by defining a class that contains four properties uh, that describe any given car on my car lot. Okay, so uh, to begin, what I'm going to do, you can see I have a project that I've already started with here, Simple Classes. Uh, go ahead and pause the video and catch up with me if you like. And what I want to do is um, work actually outside of the first class that's already been defined in our program.cs file. So I want to work inside of the namespace Simple Classes but I don't want to define a new class inside of my existing class. I want to work outside of that class here. And so I'm going to define a new car class like so. And I'm going to give it four properties and I can type it all out like this and I'll explain what I'm doing here in just a moment. Or I can use a shortcut prop tab tab and then I can use the replacement uh, the little replacement areas by using the tab on my keyboard. So I want to make a string, tab, tab, model, enter, enter, prop, tab, tab, int, year, enter, enter, prop, tab, tab, string, tab, tab, color, enter, enter. Okay, so I've just defined a class named car with four properties. 
This car class allows me to define a data type that describes a car. Every car in the world. Every car has a make, a model, a year, and a color, and a bunch of other information that I might or might not be interested in for my specific application. But my aim here is to use this definition of what comprises a car in order to create additional instances of the car class that represent all of the cars on my car lot. Okay? In other words, I want to create a bucket in the computer's memory that's just the right size to hold information about any given car on my car lot. Uh, so it should contain not only the fact that it's a car, but then also the value of its make and its model and its year and its color, all kind of in one big bucket up in the computer's memory so that I can access it. All right. So there's two parts to this. There's defining the class itself, and then once I've defined it, I can create instances of that class. So here the class is the definition but when I create a new instance of this class, then I'll be working with an object, and sometimes those terms get confused. But the class is the blueprint. The object is an instantiation or something that's been created as a result of having the blueprint or the pattern. Okay? So the way that we create a new instance of the car class is to do this. I'll just call this my car to avoid confusion. So at this point, I've defined it just like any variable I would by declaring the data type itself, whether it be string or integer. This is just a little bit more interesting, a little more complex. It's the car class. And then I give it a name that I want to call it by my car. All right. Now that's part of what I need to do. The next thing that I want to do is actually then create a new instance of that class and say, put this up in the memory in the bucket, so to speak. So here we go, new car. All right, so again, there's two parts of this equation. We'll talk about this more as we go throughout this, uh, uh, this course. But we're saying, first of all, I want to declare a new car in memory, and then I want you to actually create the car. I want to create an instance of car and then put it up in the memory. So there's two distinct steps there. All right. In the real world, you can use the same blueprint to create many different houses, right? You, you could, like in, in the neighborhoods that I've lived in before, you might describe them as cookie cutter houses. They all look the same. You could use the same pattern to create clothing over and over, or you could use the same recipe to create the same cake or casserole and get the same results each time. So each time you want to build a new house, it will be at a different address, right? Each time you follow the pattern, you'll create a new instance of the clothing that can be sold to a different customer. Each time you follow the, that recipe, you'll create a new instance of the recipe and you can offer it during either the same meal or a different meal. Right? And the same is true with classes. Each time that you create a new instance of the class, you have a new object that is distinct and separate from the other instances of that same class in the computer's memory. All right? So they each live by themselves. So a class is like a cookie cutter. Now, keep in mind, you can't eat the cookie cutter itself, right? You eat the cookies that you make from the cookie cutter. Uh, the, the, co the, the, the cookie cutter gives each of the cookies some shape. Uh, and so when you instantiate uh, a new I instance of a class, you're basically using your class as a cookie cutter to stamp out new instances. Uh, and you have, uh, you know, one, two, three, four new instances of cookies that you can then put in the oven and bake. All right. So focus on the new keyword. It is what you would consider to be the factory. It actually builds the new car and puts it into memory. All right. It uses the blueprint. It uses the pattern. It uses the recipe. It uses the cookie cutter in order to create a new instance of that blueprint or that pattern or that recipe or that cookie cutter. Uh, and it it brings the class to life in the computer's memory and it makes it usable by your application. And you can create many instances of a given class uh, or you can create many objects all based on the same class but each object will be distinct from the others. If by no other uh, distinction than by merely the address in memory where they live. 
Okay, so what I want to do is not only set the properties of this of this car because I have these four properties that I want to uh, that I want to use to distinguish this car on my car lot to represent this single car, but then also uh, I may want to then access or get those properties back out and it's working just like you're working with variables all right so in this case uh, instead of just accessing make variable I would go my car dot make right and I would set that equal to like Oldsmobile now admittedly in this particular case I am merely hard coding these values if this was a real application I would ask an end user to input this information or I grab it from a database or something along those lines. All right, so there we have it. We have one instance of the car class and I've set all of its properties and now I want to get those properties and print them out in a console window. And we'll just do this in the most easy way possible. And we access or we get the values just like we set the values before by using the name of the object dot the name of the property. Uh, so let's go make my car dot model my car dot year and my car dot uh, color. Now you might be wondering, well Bob, why did you do it that way and not car dot make or car dot model? Remember car in that instance car describes the class, the blueprint. But what we want to work with is one instance of the blueprint. So that's why we're calling that instance my car. It's the variable name in the computer memory that we want to work with. So let's go ahead and separate these out onto separate lines. And then finally, we'll uh, go console.readline, like so. And this should not be an exciting application at all because we're merely just printing things to screen okay but at least I can show creating a new instance of a class setting the properties and then getting the properties and printing them out so that's what this get and this set are for and there are actually longer versions of uh, to, to declare a property in fact let's just do this prop full tab tab and so this is a longer com more complete version of creating a uh, a property but I don't want to talk about it right now there are reasons why you would want to use this but for the most part for our simple needs we'll just use this abbreviated version of defining a property in our classes okay now did you notice that we got full IntelliSense support so whenever I typed out my car dot and I use the member accessor operator that I'm able to see all the members of the class, uh, the make, mo uh, the make, the model, the year, and the color, all represented as little wrench icons in IntelliSense, so that I can access them, whether to set their value or get their value. Okay. Furthermore, I'm able to set values the way that I would just with normal variables by using the uh, the assignment operator. Okay. Uh, I'm able to work with the variables and write them just like I would any other variable in my system. Okay, So there's nothing all that special about it outside of the fact that they're all related to a specific instance of, of a class. So we've created a new data type, the car data type. And since it's a data type, we can use it just like we would any data type in our system. So if I wanted to create a little method here, private static, and I'll use the decimal data type because I'm working with uh, going to work with dollars or money uh, currency and I'm going to create a method called determine market value All right, and uh, I'm going to allow this to accept a car as an input parameter and what I'll do is just in this case I'm just going to hard code car value to a hundred 
dollars, okay? <laughs> and we'll leave it at that. In fact, I'll go ahead and add the M here. Uh, however, if this was a real application, someday I might look up the car online using some sort of a web service to get a more accurate value. Okay, accurate value. But for today, we're just going to hard code uh, the value to be 100 and we'll return car value. Okay, and so uh, here I can go uh, determine market value. I can pass in my car and I should return back a value. So let's go uh, decimal value equals determine market value and then let's go console.write line and we'll use what we learned previously to print out the value of the car like so and let's run the application and you can see that it's worth $100 all right now notice what I did here. Uh, I used an uppercase C in car and a lowercase C in car. The uppercase C corresponds to the name of the class because I named it with a capital C. Uh, and the, the C Sharp compiler is smart enough to know that again capital C car and lowercase C car are two different things. And this is a common naming convention to use uh, the same name for an object uh, if there's no reason not to, if there wasn't something special about the car, like uh, it being uh, in some special state. But I can reuse the word car. I chose not to do that here just to make it obvious what I was actually doing. But there's nothing wrong with doing this uh, as well, defining this input parameters data type and then giving that input parameter the same name but just with the lowercase character there they're two very different things okay so moving on I want to talk about creating methods on the class we've already said that we uh, that classes are containers for methods so uh, in we've created this helper method here inside of my static void main but it might make more sense for us to create that method here inside of the car class itself since the car class already has access to information like the make model the year and the color right and that's the kind of information that we would use in making a determination on its value so here let's go ahead and define this as a public decimal determine market value now we're not going to allow anything to be passed in because we already have all the information we need right here Okay, so let's uh, create a little little algorithm here. So if the year is greater than 1990, then we will set the value of the car, the car's value, which we need to define as a, so let's go um, decimal uh, car value. We'll set the car value equal to uh, $10,000. So if it's a relatively new car, we'll set it to 10000 Otherwise, we'll say the car's value is only worth 2000 All right. So this is a very, very overly simplistic example, but we just want to demonstrate the fact that inside of an instance of the class, you're going to be able to access its properties. Okay. So we're able to access the current car's year in order to determine its value. And so in this case, what I'll do is let's comment this out and comment that out. And here we'll go uh, console dot right line uh, my car dot determine market value like so. And because this is going to come back as a decimal, I'm still going to want to format it. All right. So now let's go ahead and run the application. All right, and since it's a 1986, it's before 1990, it's only worth $2,000, okay? So in this lesson, we used a very concrete example. We've all seen cars, driven cars, owned cars, okay? A car is easy to conceptualize uh, and represent in a class because there's a tangible real-world equivalent. Now, 
My assumption, again, is that your main exposure to classes will be whenever you're using classes defined by Microsoft in the .NET Framework class library. And most of the time, those classes don't represent real tangible things. Uh, they're very conceptual in nature. You might have a class that represents a connection to the Internet. You might have a class that represents a buffer of information that's streaming from a hard drive. Okay? They don't really have real-world tangible equivalent, so you need to be aware of that. Uh, in most cases, uh, the .NET uh, Framework class library classes don't have real-world equivalents, but the ideas are exactly the same. As you mature as a software developer, you might want to invest a little bit more time in learning how to create your own library of classes. Uh, and those classes can interact with each other, they can represent real things in your company or in the real world or conceptual things. Uh, the process that you go through to break down a problem in the real world and represent it in objects is object-oriented analysis and design. Again, that's not a topic that we're going to cover in this series of lessons, but you can learn more about that at devu.com, uh, where I spend a lot of time talking about those sorts of things. Okay, so to recap, a class is just a data type in .NET, and it's similar to any other data type, like a string or an integer. It just allows you to define uh, additional properties and methods. Uh, so you can define a custom class with properties and methods, and then you create instances of those classes. Or rather, you create an instance uh, of a an class, therefore working with an object using the new operator. You can then access that object's properties and methods using the dot operator, the member accessor operator, right? Uh, so there's quite a bit more to say about classes. Don't worry if you don't understand everything just yet, uh, why you even need them, uh, how to really fully utilize them. Just make sure you understand the process that we went through in this lesson of defining a new class, creating an instance of a class, setting its properties, getting its properties, passing an instance of a class into a method or even defining the method inside the class itself and allowing it to access its own members like its other properties okay uh, so if you really don't understand much more than that then you're doing just fine you're exactly where you need to be don't worry we'll cover lots of other topics related to this in the upcoming lessons we'll see you there thank you Hi, I'm Bob Tabor with Developer University. For more of my training videos for beginners, please visit me at devu.com. In this lesson, we'll continue to talk about classes and methods. We'll begin by talking about the lifetime of objects. So objects come to life, they live for a period of time, and then they die. They're removed from memory. And we'll talk about the .NET Framework runtime and its role in the uh, in the creation, the maintenance, and then ultimately the removal of objects from memory. Next we'll talk about constructors, which are simply methods that allow us to write code as developers at the moment when a new instance of a class is created. And then finally we'll talk about static methods and properties. That static keyword's been lingering around now for some time, and uh, we've been using uh, static properties and static methods throughout this course, even from our very first example. So we'll finally tackle that issue in this lesson. All right, so let's begin by uh, creating a new project. You can see I've already done that. You can pause the video and catch up to where I'm at right now. I've created a new project called Object Lifetime. Furthermore, you'll see that I copied the car definition from our previous lesson. If you like, you can type that in, help build some muscle memory help remind you to use the prop tab tab uh, shortcut, uh, the code snippet in Visual Studio to create uh, these, these uh, shortened auto-implemented versions of properties. We'll talk about that in a little while. And then ultimately you can see in line number 13 we create a new instance of our car class. That new instance we'll call my car. 
And we talked about this in the previous lesson, but I felt like this deserved a little bit more explanation because there is actually a lot that's going on under the hood, and it would be helpful to understand this uh, as we begin to work with classes and objects. So whenever we uh, issue a command to create a new instance of a class like we have in line number 13, the .NET Framework runtime has to go out and create a spot in the computer's memory that's large enough to hold a new instance of the car class. Now that much we know. The computer's memory has addresses that are similar to street addresses like the address you live at, the address that I live at. Now admittedly a computer's memory addresses look dramatically different than our addresses like 123 East Main Street uh, you know uh, because the computer's addresses are typically represented in hexadecimal values, but they're known addresses nonetheless, and it's easy then for the computer to find something in its memory by using its address. So the .NET Framework's first job is to find an empty available address where nothing is currently living, where there's no data that's currently being stored, and that address has to be large enough to store an instance of our class. So the .NET Framework runtime will then create the object instance and it will copy any of its values that are currently stored in that object instance up into that memory address. Then it takes note of where it put that object. It notes the address of the memory where it put that instance of our object. And then it serves that address back to us and we store that address in the actual name of or the instance name of our class, in this case my car. That variable is actually holding on to a reference or in other words an address in the computer's memory where we can access that object once again. Now whenever we need to access the new instance of the car class we merely can use its reference name. It's in this case my car. So my car is simply holding an address it's simply a reference to an instance of, in this case, a car class in the computer's memory. Whenever you need to work with that instance of the car class, you just use the my car identifier and the .NET Framework class library, I'm sorry, the .NET Framework runtime takes care of everything else for you. It gives you the illusion that you're actually working with the object itself, but in reality, you're just holding on to a reference to an address in the computer's memory. Now there's an analogy that helps me to to sort all this out in my mind and we're going to continue to extend that bucket analogy. If that object is stored in the computer's memory and if it's what we have equated to a bucket, an address, an area that holds on to our values, then what's returned back to us as programmers is a handle. That's what my car is. It's our handle to the bucket. And we've used that bucket analogy a number of different times and it served us well. But we essentially are storing values in that bucket just like we were before. And we're holding on to that bucket using our, our reference to that memory area in our computer's memory. So what happens if we were to let go of the handle? Well, at that point, we'll no longer be able to get back to the bucket. We've lost the bucket somewhere in uh, the computer's memory. The bucket will no longer be accessible to us. Now, can we ever get back to that bucket? Well, no. Uh, what happens is that the .NET Framework runtime will be constantly monitoring the memory that it manages and it's looking for objects that uh, no longer have any handles associated with them. So once we let go of a handle, the reference count, the, the handle count, I guess you could call it, will go to zero. And at that point, the .NET Framework uh, runtime will say, I see that nobody's interested in you anymore. They've, they've let all of their handles to you expire or to go out of scope. So that must mean that you're no longer needed and it removes it and throws it in the garbage. And so that process of monitoring memory, looking for objects that no longer have any references to them, is called garbage collection. It's one of the core features of the .NET Framework runtime. And it's one of the reasons why it's easier to work with C Sharp at first as a developer than maybe going directly to C++. In an unmanaged language like C++, you, the developer, may have to manage 
memory on your own. And sometimes you might forget that you actually uh, are leaving things in memory and you're not cleaning them up, you're not removing them yourself. So your application might have a memory leak. Or you might have a corrupted memory region where you're you're using an area of memory and you forget that you're using it so you copy something else to that area of memory. Now you go back to retrieve the, the value that you originally put in there and it's corrupted. Uh, so that uh, leads to corrupted memory in applications. You don't really get that issue so much in C-sharp because again the .NET Framework runtime takes care of all the memory management for you. All right, so let's do a little experiment here. If we said that we can have one handle to a bucket, what happens uh, if we attempt to create a second handle to the same bucket? So let me do this real quick. Let me go to um, my car and start setting some of the properties like the make equals Oldsmobile. Uh, then we'll set the model equal to the Cutlass Supreme. And then we'll set the year equal to 1986. And then finally, we'll set the color to silver. All right, now keep that in mind. We've created a new object called uh, my, or that we're referencing using the my car uh, identifier. This car class lives, instance of the car class lives in memory, and we're holding on to it with a handle called my car. But what if we were to create another? car like this, so my other car. What have we really done right now? We simply have created a, a handle, but we've not attached it to any buckets of, of cars in our computer's memory. So at this point, what I could do is go my other car equals my car. Now what have we really done there? Well, we've merely taken one handle to, uh, to a bucket in memory, and we've created a second handle and said, hey, let me copy your address so that we're both referencing the same bucket in the computer's memory. Now to prove that, what I'll do is do a console.writeline uh, and we will do what we did before. Whoops, whoops, whoops. All right, and uh, just give me a second here. And we'll reference my other cars make my other cars model my other cars year and then my other cars uh, color let me separate these to different lines for readability sake like so Whoops. alright and then a console.readline for good measure now let's run the application. All right, and you can see that even though we created or set the properties of my car, since we copied the reference to the car object in the computer's memory into a new uh, variable called my other car, I can still get to the values that are uh, that are in memory because they're both pointed to the same object, right? And now I can even do something like this, where I actually change something. My other car dot, uh, let's set the model equal to the, uh, to the 98. That was the large style model for that car. And let's then go back to and do something similar to this, just to prove that they're one and the same here. And I'll say, hey, Let's do that, okay? So we're going to use our reference called my other car and set the model, change the model from the value Cutlass Supreme to the 98. And then we're going to say, hey, show me what's in the my car uh, object, all right? So now we're gonna run the application and you can see now we're printing out what's currently in my car, it's the same thing that we changed in my other car, because they're both pointed to the same place. I just want to emphatically make that point here, all right? Okay, so as you can see, we have now two references to the same object in memory. We essentially uh, attached a second handle to the same bucket so that we can 
use either one to retrieve the data in the bucket, so to speak. All right. If you don't like that analogy, maybe it helps to think of, of this in terms of balloons. So I have a balloon and I have two strings tied to the balloon. What happens when I cut the first string? I'm still holding on to the balloon, but what happens when I cut the second string? The balloon now will fly away and we'll never see it ever again, okay? So as references go out of scope, in other words, whenever the current thread of execution leaves the current code block that we're currently in, uh, or those object references are set to null intentionally by the software developer, then the number of references to the object the number of handles to the bucket, the number of strings attached to the balloon that go to zero. And so here again, when the .NET Framework runtime looks through memory and finds objects that have a reference count of zero, it will remove those objects from memory. So we talked about the two instances in which the, the connections to the object get removed. One is that the the uh, the reference goes out of scope. So whenever we create a new uh, a new variable called my car, it will continue to be in scope as long as we're inside of this main method. But once we exit out of the main method, that variable goes out of scope. It's no longer available for us to access any longer. The same would be true if we created a a method, a different method, and defined a variable. And as soon as we go out of scope of that method and we have finished executing all the lines of code in that method, uh, then any of the variables that were declared inside of that method go out of scope. And in this case, we would lose then any references to the objects that we created in the context of that method. All right. So that's one instance in which we'll lose references to objects that we've created. But the second is if we, as the developers, actively take uh, a, a role in, in cutting the strings or removing the handles from the buckets in memory. And the way that we do that is by setting our objects equal to null. The value null is not zero and it's not an empty string. It just means indeterminate. In this case, what we'll do is go here and we'll set uh, my other car equal to null, like so. And when we do this, now we'll remove one of the handles to the bucket. So we're back to just one handle in the bucket. To prove this, let me go ahead and copy this little section of code and go here and put it below this. And when I do that, notice what happens. We'll get an exception. The exception is that there's a null reference exception that was unhandled. Uh, and the reason why it was a null reference exception is because we have now remove the handle. The handle does not point to any objects in memory, and yet we're still attempting to access values from the object in memory, so we get an exception in our application. All right. Now, what were to happen if we were to remove uh, the second reference, like so, my car equals null. All right. Well, at that point now, we have removed all the references to the bucket, even if we were to attempt to get to it with either my other car or my car, either way, the references are gone completely. And so now the object will be removed at some indeterminate time in the future by the .NET Framework runtime. And so in some situations, this indeterminate period of time can cause a problem, especially when the object in memory is holding on to some special resource, maybe something like a reference to a network connection or a file on the file system or holding on to uh, an access, uh, a handle to access a given database. Uh, so again, we don't know exactly when the .NET Framework runtime will, will actually execute the garbage collection step, and that might pose a problem in certain situations. In these cases, you would want to use a more deterministic approach to requesting that .NET removes the object from memory and, uh, if necessary, will finalize and clean up 
any uh, anything that needs to happen inside of that object to completely get rid of it in the computer's memory. So in these cases you want to learn about deterministic finalization. That's a little bit of an advanced topic so we're not going to talk about it in this series of lessons. Just keep in mind that whenever we set reference to null or whenever we go out of scope we will be removing all the references to our objects but the .NET Framework runtime itself figures out when it's ready and willing to remove those those objects from memory completely. In most cases, that's not a problem. Occasionally, you're going to run into a situation where it is a problem. Know that there is a remedy for it called deterministic finalization. Okay, so that should suffice uh, our explanation of really what's going on whenever we create new instances of objects, how objects are maintained in memory, and then at what point they're removed from memory. So let's move on and talk about constructors. And I said at the very outset, that a constructor is merely a method that allows us as developers to execute code at the moment that a new instance of a class is created. So there's something really subtle about what's going on here in this line of code, line number 13. Did you notice that whenever we use the new, new keyword and we give it the name of the, the, the class that we want to create a new instance of, that we're also calling it using the method invocation operator? Why do you suppose that is? Whether you realize it or not, you're calling a method whenever you create a new instance of a class, and that method is referred to as a constructor. And it allows you, the developer, uh, the option, you don't have to do this, so it's an option, to write some code at that very moment whenever a new instance of a class is created. So constructors can be used really for any purpose, but typically they're used in order to put that new object into a valid state, meaning that you can use it to initialize the values uh, of the properties of that given object, and so it's immediately usable. Now, let me give you a really quick example here. Let's say that you want to create a constructor that would allow you to set a property of the car at the point whenever you create a new car class. So uh, that, that property is available immediately in the very next line of code whenever we begin to work with it here in line number 15. So whenever you uh, actually want to create a constructor, you would go and create something like this. Public car. And in this case, what I'm going to do is simply set the make uh, property to Nissan. So by default, whenever we create a new car class, we're going to set one of its properties, the make property, to Nissan. All right. Now let me say this as well. You might see the keyword this used. The this keyword is optional. It refers to this instance of this object. And it's just to help clarify where this uh, variable name or this name is coming from. When I see the this keyword, I automatically think, oh, that's part of the declaration of the class itself. It's saying that you want to access a, uh, a, a member of this class that's been created, okay? But as you can see, it's kind of um, faded out in my text editor. It might not be in yours, which lets me know that I could actually remove this. It's not necessary, all right? So you might see that, though, in other people's code. Just understand what that is. All right, so now if we were to go ahead and create um, a new instance of the car class, uh, here's what I'll do. I'll actually comment out all of this code, like so. And then uh, I'll comment out the code that we know will break the application. Let's, well, we can leave the rest of it, I suppose. Now whenever we run the application, uh, notice that the very first item that is uh, displayed is the make of the car, and it's set to Nissan. So uh, I didn't set any other properties. That's why we didn't get any other values there in the printout. But hopefully you can at least see how we go about creating constructors. Now, admittedly, it may not make a lot of sense right now why you'd want to do this, but I'm showing you the technique you'd use, not the rationale necessarily. But the rationale is simple. What we would typically do here is to put any new instance of an object into a valid state. So you could um, load 
values into the various properties of your class from a configuration file or from a database or some other place in order again to get that object into a valid state so that it's immediately usable at the point of uh, whenever it's instantiated all right so Let's go ahead and talk about overloaded constructors. You'll see this frequently whenever working with objects in the .NET Framework class library. Uh, so just like you can create an overloaded method in your classes by changing the method signature, uh, in other words, the number and the data type of the input parameters for the method, you can do the same thing with a constructor. Uh, you can create an overloaded constructor. So what I'm gonna do is create an overloaded constructor here like so. Now, at this point, the method signatures are the same, so I'm going to get a little error here. But to modify that, I will merely add at least one input parameter of type string. But I'll go ahead and do them all as well. So, And then here in the body of the constructor, I would just do make equals make. So this capital M make is in reference to the property itself. This lowercase m and make is the name of the input parameter. It's a good convention to use the same name for uh, readability's sake and for your own sanity. You don't have to do it this way, uh, but just keep in mind that uppercase m and lowercase m are two different, create two different items in uh, as far as C sharp is concerned. Okay, so it's not confused. You might be confused, but it will be able to handle this just fine. Okay, now you might ask, well, what's the point of that? Well, in many cases, whenever you create a new instance of a class, typically you don't want to take five steps to do this. You would want to uh, immediately, whenever you create um, a new instance of a class, so car, my third car equals new car. At this point, you can do and one of two things. Notice here that underneath car underneath the open parenthesis I have one of two ways that I can call the constructor I can e either give it no uh, input parameters or I can give it uh, four strings as input parameters to initialize that new instance of car and put it into a valid state immediately so here I might uh, go forward escape 2005 white like so and now I have not only created a new instance of the car class, but I've immediately initialized its values by calling its overloaded constructor uh, to, uh, to, to populate all of its values at the moment of, of instantiation, all right? So what were to happen if we were to actually remove these two completely? What if we were to comment these out? What happens? So you can see that we're still using the method invocation operator uh, for our new instance of car. That would suggest that we're calling a constructor, but we don't have a constructor defined. So why is this working? Why isn't it giving us an error? Well, the reason is because a default constructor is automatically created for you whenever you compile your your classes. It will be a constructor without any input parameters and it will have no body. Uh, but it's essentially the equivalent of doing this right here except with nothing inside of it. All right, so that's created automatically for you. So no matter what, you're going to have a constructor. It just won't do anything for you. The implicit default constructor has no input parameters, no method body but it allows you to make calls and create new instances of classes in a consistent way. So it's actually just generated for you, again, at compile time. Of course, uh, by defining it yourself, you're taking control of the process of instantiation. All right, so let's talk about the static keyword now. Uh, you've seen static uh, around since the very beginning. I said, let's ignore that for now. Uh, we created our own uh, methods and I said we have to use the keyword static I'll explain later well now is the time so I want to ask a question did you ever notice that whenever we we're working with the console window we never had to create an instance of console the console class in order to call its methods right and that 
it combined with the fact that whenever we wanted to work with date time, we could we could get to this moment in time by using the date time dot now property, but we never had to create an instance of date time. Uh, furthermore, uh, whenever we were actually working with arrays and we wanted to call the reverse method. Do you remember we did re array dot reverse and then we passed in the array itself? How is it that we were able to use the reverse method without creating an instance of the array class? Well in each of these cases the creators of those classes or specifically those methods adorned their uh, methods with the keyword static, which means that you do not have to create an instance of the class in order to utilize that method. In some cases, they may have defined an entire class as static, meaning that all of its properties and methods were static. So you can create your own static methods and classes as well. Uh, again, the objective here at the very outset is to just help you utilize the .NET Framework class library. Uh, so just know that some of the classes and methods in the .NET Framework class library uh, are, are static and some are instance or require you to create an instance of the class before you call its methods and properties. All right. So uh, the static methods will be available to you without first requiring you to create an instance of a class. So just so you can see how this works, we can create a static method on our car class, like so. Uh, in this case, we'll go public static void my method. And here we'll do console.write line um, called static my method. All right. And now we can go here near the very top and just say car dot my method and notice I didn't have to create an instance of car I'm using the actual car class definition itself when we run the application alright and before we go too far here let's comment out pretty much everything uh, let's remove that and we'll go down here alright just make this so that we don't run into any potential issues here so let's run the application and you can see that uh, we were able to successfully call the static my method. Now what would happen if we attempted to reference one of the properties in our uh, in our class. So let's just print out the make uh, property. Notice that I immediately get a red squiggly line beneath the word make it says that an object reference is required for the non-static field method or property called car.make. So it's important to keep in mind that there's a fundamental difference between working with classes that have static members versus instance members. Instance members are the things like we've been working up to this point where we have a, uh, a series of properties that describe a single instance of a given entity like a car. Uh, there might be methods that operate on a single instance of a car like the constructors that we saw. Whereas a static member, like a static method in this case, they don't really operate on any single instance. They're more like utilities. Uh, you can call them at any time. They're not, they don't depend on the state of a given instance of the class or even the application itself that can be used at any time because they're not really tied to one specific car. They're true of all cars and can be used at any time. All right, so static members versus instance members. Just keep those two clean in your mind. Now, you might want to ask the question, why would you ever create a static member like a static method? Well, that's a bit more complicated. Uh, that might require a longer discussion of things like design patterns, which are common solutions to common problems for software developers, or coding heuristics, which are more the best ways to go about solving problems. Uh, I just want you to know that there's a fundamental difference between static members in a class and instance members of a class, and it's easy to, to recognize them 
if it's a static member, it'll have the static keyword, okay? Uh, and in which case, you cannot reference any instance uh, instance members like instance properties or even other instance methods that act on instance properties all right they require an instance of the class to operate so just know that there are these two types of, of members in a given class and that you're going to encounter both whenever you're working with the dot net firmware based uh, the, the class library uh, and why you would use one or the other well that's that's really again another story I would say this that typically I would recommend that you don't mix and match them in the same class clearly not everybody agrees with me because you'll find that uh, many times but it's not really important at this point to understand why you would use one or the other just know that that possibility exists that's why you don't always have to create an instance of a class before you use the members of its class in this case uh, a given a given method all right so let's recap what we talked about in this lesson we began talking about uh, the lifetime of an object how we create a new instance of an object what that's doing in terms of creating an area in the computer's memory returning back to us an address a reference to that object in memory what happens during the lifetime of that object and ultimately what happens whenever we remove all of the references to that object we talked about the role of the dotnet framework runtime and how it's keeping track of the number of references to objects so that it can perform garbage collection on objects that have no more references to them in memory as a means of keeping things clean and making the memory available to other applications or even our application again. Uh, we talked about constructors and how developers can use them to, uh, to put a new instance of an object into a valid state uh, at the point when that object is, is created. Then we talked about the static keyword. We looked at some usages of static members inside of the .NET Framework class library. We looked at creating our own static member, this main or this my method. We talked about the difference between static members and instance members and how it's really oil and water. You can't mix the two and why that is. Uh, we didn't really talk about why you would choose to use one over the other. However, that's, again, a topic for another day. So hopefully all of these concepts make sense. If not, don't continue on uh, and hoping that you'll just catch up to them at some point in the future. Make sure you thoroughly understand this before you continue on. Okay? If you are continuing, great. We'll see you in the next lesson. We'll see you there. Thanks. That's all for this episode. I hope this tutorial was helpful. Is your mind ringing with questions, queries, or doubts? Do you wish to learn more? Then visit our website, www.millionlights.org, and post your questions on our forums. We will be extremely happy to clear all your doubts. If you missed anything and want to re-watch it, you can download it from our website or can watch it online too. You can also participate in our webinars, discussions with the subject experts, as well as get Microsoft certification on various courses through our website. You can also find us on Facebook with the name Million Lights, as well as on Twitter. For more such interesting tutorials on coding, keep watching Microsoft Hour of Code, brought to you by Million Lights. Thank you.